Thank you, Chaplain. Good morning, everyone. I'm here with my friends, Mike and Patrick. Guys in the back, stand up, please. There we are. Yeah. Field guys, my name is Bob Blinko. Some people tell me I'm not the brightest pencil in the silverware drawer. Here's a picture of me in a hotel elevator in Chiang Mai from last August. Can you read the sign on the floor buttons? The sign says, sterilized every 30 minutes. My wife looked right at me without smiling and said, this explains everything, Bob. But I plod on. William Carey, the great shoemaker from England, who left all that was familiar to take up a life among all that was foreign in India, Carey became a linguist and a translator and a printer by necessity said, others are more gifted, but I can plod. I can persevere in any definite pursuit. To this I owe everything. That's me, how about you? How many of you are pretty sure others are more qualified, but being talented is somewhat overrated? Most of the so-called worthies I have met over the years are not very courageous. God qualifies whom God calls. So I would like to meet those of you that are pretty sure that smarter people or holier people might be in this place, but that you feel a call upon, God's, God, upon your lives, perhaps to overseas service, and you would like some help in sorting that out. I'd like to meet you. The Bible says we have received grace, that is the charism. We have received grace and apostleship in order to bring about the obedience of faith among the ethne. If you want to be important, you probably won't become a missionary. If you want public recognition, you probably want to keep at it in America. Most missionaries serve in obscurity, like the 70 that Jesus sent out. We don't know their names. Few have been famous even for 15 minutes in the missionary world. But may Jesus Christ open our hearts, especially those of you students who want to believe that there's a higher calling than to have our name in lights. That's what receiving grace and apostleship is all about. I want to talk today about completing the Christian mission in the Muslim world and tell you why my hair is on fire. May God enable us to focus our mission efforts where the needs are so great. The future for Muslims is more hopeful today than it has been in many centuries. In his recent remarkable book, A Wind in the House of Islam, author David Garrison totals up the number of movements to, to Christianity occurring recently in the Muslim world. Garrison defines a movement as a thousand people coming to faith in Christ and some other positive characteristics of a movement. In the final years of the 20th century, something began to happen that has never happened before. And in the first 12 years of the 21st century, look what has happened. This trend is rising. Truly, it is a small beginning, but very hopeful. It does seem to indicate that the Lord is making his move in the Muslim world. Aslan is on the move. I live in Arizona. One morning, the phone rang in my office. It was a call from a producer of a television show. His name was John Marks, and he's a producer for 60 Minutes. He said he was coming to my office to produce a news story on our movement. He said he was interested in the story of Christian missionaries who are living in the Muslim world. Mr. Mark said that all of America would be interested in the mission of frontiers. But I thought of my missionaries and the safety of my children who live overseas. What should I do? He said he was coming and indeed he came. We sat down at a table to talk. Mr. Marks was a good man. He wanted everyone to know about our mission. I took a statue in my hands and brought it to the table in my office. It was a statue of St. Francis of Assisi. I said, this is a statue which was given to me by a Muslim who came to faith in Jesus Christ through one of our missionaries. Ahmed put his faith in Christ. He's a believer now. And Ahmed gave me this statue. And Ahmed lives now to bow the knee to Jesus Christ, live by the Bible, and by the prayer of St. Francis. And I prayed the prayer of St. Francis. 
It's a prayer that you know. And this is how it goes. Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, healing. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light. Where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive. It is in pardoning that we are pardoned. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. And Mr. John Mark said, yes, this is the story we would like to tell all over the world. And I said, if you do, our people will be put in harm's way. It would be better to let us do our work quietly without attention from the media. So what I want to talk about today is what I did not feel free to say on national television. Let me speak to you of the quiet mission of bringing God's love to Muslims everywhere. You have heard a lot of scary stories in the Muslim world, me too, but I do not believe in telling scary stories. They do not edify, they do not fill our hearts with love, they fill our hearts with fear. And someone has said, perfect fear casts out love. I know a lot of scary stories. We just wanna start though with God's glory and God's love. And the way of the Lord is to overcome fear by thinking carefully and deeply about his love for us. We think of 1 John chapter 4, love one another for love is from God. He who loves his brother, he knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. God is love. So what I want to say is that fear is the opposite of faith. We want to say that safety is in the mix of what we care about most, but it's not number one or number two. Most of all, number one is the person of Christ and following him and being sure that his will is the place where people should be if they want to be near to God. Can you be a loving, bold person and a free person if you are afraid? We go to Islam to bring the hope of Jesus Christ to Muslims because they are people who live without hope and without God. Kenneth Bailey, 50 years in the Middle East, was asked on a home furlough here in the United States, why do you keep going back to the Middle East when there is no hope there? Because, he said, there is no hope there. Some of us see things differently. God has planted into our hearts a respect for women in the world, for children in the world, for the marginalized, for the handicapped, for the strangers, for the people in the world who are put upon by uh, the majority peoples around them because of their minority status. Because through people like the plotters of God, like William Carey, we will reconcile millions to Christ and to one another. And for us, we believe that for many in the Muslim world, the time is short. Dear God, was there ever before in our lifetime such wanton disregard for humanitarian rights as has been seen this year in much of the Middle East? Our desire, was that the mayhem that convulsed the Middle East a year ago would somehow abate. Did the Lord not hear our prayers? The cruelties committed in the Middle East the last 12 months defy comprehension. Make no mistake, the meaning of peace in Islam is the rule of Sharia law everywhere. We Christians are instruments of God's peace. The future of the peace of the world lies in our hands. Let us submit to the God of the Sermon on the Mount, the Lord who guides us in sublime wisdom and radically reforms the penitent souls around the one another's of the New Testament.
Let us commit ourselves to Christ's great summary of the law, loving God with all our heart and our neighbor as ourselves. With the love of Christ compelling and the Holy Spirit empowering and the witness of the martyrs looking down and the promises of God in play, we can attempt great things for God and expect great things from God. And if you can think of anything more exciting than that, you'll have to tell me, because I can't. Call me crazy, but this is what happens when a band of brothers and sisters, a happy few, believe that nothing is impossible with God. And that is why my hair is on fire. In a remarkable book, The Better Angels of Our Nature, the atheist Steven Pinker surprises the reader with a delightful discourse on how violence in the world has declined. Pinker writes, believe it or not, and I know that most people do not believe it, he says, violence has declined over long stretches of time, and today we live in perhaps the most peaceable area, era of our species' existence. No matter how small the percentage of violent deaths may be, he writes, in absolute numbers there is always enough to fill the evening news. Pinker writes, so people's impressions of violence will be disconnected from the actual proportions. Also, he says, no one has ever recruited activists to a cause by telling them that things are getting better. He says, a large swath of our intellectual culture is loath to admit that there could be anything good about civilization or Western society. According to Pinker, the world has been getting steadily more peaceful since the end of the Second World War. We fail to see it because there is, quote, always enough violent death to fill the news. I have to say that I have found Pinker's charts and statistics persuasive. We, re we live in relatively peaceful times, except in the Muslim world. In the middle of his 500-page book, Mr. Pinker devotes just a few pages to the places in the world where peace has not prevailed. He says, the Muslim world, to all appearances, is sitting out the decline of violence. He says, the impression that the Muslim world indulges in the kinds of violence that the West has outgrown is not a symptom of Islamophobia or Orientalism, but is borne out by the numbers. Though about a fifth of the world's population is Muslim, more than half of the armed conflicts in the world occur in Muslim countries or insurgencies there. Pinker continues, and this is hard for me to read. More than 100 million girls in Islamic countries have had their genitals mutilated, and many Muslim women have been disfigured with acid or killed outright if they displease their fathers, their brothers, or their husbands who have been forced upon them. A majority of the countries in which slavery continues are Muslim. This is because Muhammad owns slaves, and a stream cannot rise higher than its source. Violence sanctioned in the Islamic world is not just by religious superstition, but by a hyper-developed culture of honor. Dear God, make me an instrument of thy peace. Where there is hatred, let me so love. Where there is injury, healing. The message of Jesus Christ has made a difference. In your lives, in mine, the yeast is in the dough. The work has begun, and if we are not a Christian nation, let's at least say that the contest has been joined by those who are reading the Bible and naming Christ as their master and peacemaker. People who follow Jesus Christ are turning to peace as the way to resolve conflicts. So the best thing you can do, I believe, is to send your people to the Muslim world in order that they too might be participating in the reconciliation of the world through Jesus Christ. Maybe you're going to raise your family in the burbs and go four-wheeling on the weekends. I get that, because you want what's best for your children. But some of us have raised our children in crazy places. And I met some of my MK friends yesterday. And uh, we want to say that the Lord has been blessing the Muslim, the people that have raised their families in the other parts of the world. Muslims to Americans seem to be the least likable or least likely people to bow the knee to Christ. To many, they are the least approachable with their strange ways. So it seems to people that do not know or make friends with the wonderful Muslim people in the world. The least likely, least likable, least approachable, and Jesus said, go to the least of these. 
He said, as you have done it unto the least of these, you've done it unto me. So let's not go where people are most like us or even most likable. Most missionaries go where other missionaries have been for many decades. Most churches send their dollars to the, help the people that are most like us. Not radical enough, said Jesus. Let's go to the least of these. I think of a Frontiers couple, Hans and Heidi, who are doing their missions in a radical way. They sold their possessions, cried to say goodbye at an airport here in America, left all that was familiar, and are raising their lives among all that is foreign. Now they live among hundreds of thousands of Muslim neighbors. In fact, they and their team are the only missionaries residing in a city full of Muslim people. Li living conditions are pretty hard. To tell you the truth, there's a bad odor coming in from when they opened the windows, smell of sewers just outside the windows. So they had to mount a fan and blow the air continually outward to keep them from smelling this smell day and night. But they feel like they've been called to go to the least and that these light and momentary afflictions are achieving for them an eternal glory. You know how people say the last but not least. In this case, the last seem to be the least. The last peoples without the gospel in their cultures are the Muslims. We have done the math. We've counted hundreds of unengaged Muslim people groups. That means no Christians and no missionaries. That means where there are no pushpins in anybody's missionary maps. We are the instruments of God's peace. My friends, where is the instruments of God's peace needed the most? I tell you, I know where there are 1,100 unengaged Muslim people groups who are still without hope and without God. And we have received grace and apostleship in order to bring about the obedience of faith among the nations, among the ethne. The mission of Jesus Christ to the Muslims is for those who live in India and Pakistan and Chad and Sudan and the great island of Sumatra and the great island of Sulawesi in Indonesia and the Caucasus region of southern Russia. These areas and others are the places where the majority of the unengaged Muslims live. Friends, on some future day, when the history of the world is told, we will say that at the end there was a great ingathering of the Muslim peoples who came to Christ in the 11th hour of history. And everyone will glorify God more for his grace and salvation that is bringing to the least likely, the least lackable, and the least expected the good news of the gospel, the people bowing their knees to Christ in these days. When it comes to Jesus Christ's fame and glory, perhaps God has saved the best till now. Daniel T. La Daniel T. Niles of Sri Lanka, himself from a non-Christian background, came to faith and said this, Christianity is simply one beggar telling another where to find bread. I would like to keep the conversation going with you. We have found bread in Jesus Christ. We are simply one beggar telling another. We are no better than the Muslim peoples of the world. They are just like us. But there is a terrible thorn in the paw of Muslim people, and it hurts. And we must extract the thorn through Jesus Christ's grace, through Jesus Christ's way of making us and all people into instruments of God's peace, so that it might be said, as Paul said, we are reconciling the world to himself through Jesus Christ, and we are instruments of his peace and the ambassadors of his calling. Those of us who gather here today at Wheaton, in the land of liberty, pray that the good news that has come to you and to me in Jesus Christ will soon and very soon come to pass for all the peoples of the world. Thank you very much.